It's a great opportunity to, uh, to introduce you to my friend Jeff Horning from St. Louis. Uh, Jeff is the owner of the Walnut Log, and, and he happens to be my house guest for the next couple of days. You know, here in Atlanta, we got a perfect storm of clubs and, and workshops and uh, wood shops and everything. So uh, Jeff's going to be demonstrating tonight at uh, Woodcraft at the Atlanta Wood Turning Guild and tomorrow night for the Georgia Association of Wood Turners down at uh, Georgia Tech. So welcome, Jeff. Glad you could come and, 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 and visit and hang out with me. Thanks for uh, having today. me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it, it's a great opportunity to come down and share some of the things that I know with uh, you and your club and uh, two other clubs. I'm doing. Uh, I, I'm doing a total of three clubs this week, and uh, really enjoying what we've done so far. Having a good time, and it's kind of excited to be in, in Mike's shop and and hanging out for a couple of days and getting some tips from the master himself as well. Yeah, yeah right. We, I, I met Jeff up at uh, at Portland at the uh, last summer and then uh, saw him again when he was down for the Turning Southern Style Symposium at, at, at Dalton. Uh, and I mentioned Yorkshire Grid. Uh, Jeff gave me a, a can to try out and uh, I really do like it. It's a great, you know, I've done a bunch of videos on making something similar, abrasive paste, and and that works great if you're doing, if you like to mess with stuff or you got a club and you can do a bunch of it, but for the individual, I think you better off just buying, <laughs> buying a can of Yorkshire Grid. But but clearly, Yorkshire Grid is a big improvement over that uh, U-Butte uh, Tripoli that I used to use. Yeah, this this one, this product really is as good as they say. It really um, is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start roughing in a pulling motion, and this will allow me to be in a slightly different position. I feel for me and my style of turning gets me a little more uh, gets me a little more work done in a little bit less time. And uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and see what that looks like. I want to watch out for this. There's a there's a piece of bark here that's probably going to come off, uh, but I'm wearing a face shield and I'll keep myself out of the line of fire as well, just to make sure that everything is safe. I also like a little more speed. Well, now yeah. that I got the edges knocked off. Yeah. Yeah, he did the hard part. I'm going to take. I'm going to do the easy stuff. But I don't know if you could hear that. There's there's a high pitched ticking, and that's that that piece of bark. Whenever you're turning, make sure you're not only watching what you're doing, but you're paying attention to what it sounds like. I often have uh, music playing in the background, but I make sure it's not so loud that I can't hear what the wood's telling me. I know that piece is loose and it might come off. I just got to pay attention. And there it goes. Once I get a little more of my shape, I can switch to a pushing cut. It's an unsupported pushing cut. Still got a still got a funny spot right there. I'm going to modify the design a little bit. All right, so I want to go back to my pushing cut. I want to work this edge down. There's a couple of rough spots. Do you have Bradford Pear in St. Louis? Yes, we do. And the only thing it's good for is turning. <laughs> Amen. It is, it is a rotten, hateful tree. Can I have a witness? Amen. Um, you have to prune it every six months in order to maintain anything. And you really need to figure uh, that it's only going to live 7 to 21 years maximum. That's the longest you're going to get out of a Bradford pear in an urban setting. I'll have a clip here to my to an earlier video I did on Bradford pear. It is a wonderful wood turning wood and it talks about some of those issues that you talked about, Jeff. Yeah. How would you feel about leaving leaving that and leaving that? How would you feel about leaving that? If you like it, go for it. I think I think I do. All right, so I'm going to real quick refine the outside. I'm just going to run over uh, in a shearing scrape just to knock off a few more tool marks, and then I'll turn it back over to Mike for the foot. So my flute's now closed. I'm working on the inside of that bottom wing. 
I'm not applying hardly any pressure. I just want to refine that surface and get rid of as much of the tool marks that I've left as possible. Now that, that chatter, that's the, uh, that's the flaws that we're leaving and turning into features. So that's, that's changing things just a little bit. I need to ease up the pressure. Sanding, I think. Of the de of the, the size of the tenon. So we're just gonna well, I'm gonna roughly mark that. Okay. All right, when you did that with your calipers. Were you touching both of the points, or were you only touching one of the points? Yeah, that's a good good point, Jeff, uh, to, to emphasize. I only touched the lower point, and I was trying to brace myself a little bit on the tool rest. But I was watching where the other one, uh, so I could move it a little bit, so this one floats over the, the scribe mark, otherwise I'd have to adjust a little bit. But I don't do both of them at the same time, because that tends to cause problems. Problems are bad. Problems are bad. This is going to come right in. Get a small foot on it. Or tenon. As a general rule, I don't like to to finish a tenon with a bowl gouge, I just don't feel comfortable being able to get it in there nice, clean, and square. So I tend to shift. I tend to shift at this point to a detail gouge. It's got a lot of beef. beef. Detail gouge is not milled as deep as a regular spindle gouge, and I can come in there and refine it and get in nice and get into that corner, get a nice clean corner. Come across the bottom, make sure I got it surfaced. Now I look at these, I haven't used these before. These are actually dovetail jaws, so I'm going to go ahead and have to make a little bit of a dovetail. And I'm just going to nip that corner there. Alright, so I think we're ready to turn it around. So I'm going to take it off of this, this chuck and put it on the other chuck. So that's it, that hole for the pin jaws. I don't think the camera, camera was running earlier. Okay, that's the first time I dropped it. Now this is a Supernova 2 chuck with record power jaws because it, it they tighten in a different direction. I put the number one in three on the numbered guides and the two and the four record power says if you use their jaws on a Nova Chuck you need to reverse the two and the four position which I've done on this. Alright now we're ready to do the inside. If I do several bowls a lot of times I'll move my tail stock out of the way but just for this one I think I'm going to leave it and not bother to mess with that. I tell, I tell folks there's only three things you got a beginner needs to know about uh, uh, turning. Number one, if it's almost sharp, it'll almost cut. A, B, C, anchor the tool, ride the bevel, and then control the, control the cut. And then the third one is understanding grain. So the trick about grain is understanding where the pencil is. You sharpen a pencil from large to small where there's always supported fibers out, out front. So in this case, that's the direction of the pencil. When we're doing on the outside of the bowl, the pencil is actually going in the other direction, so you go from small to large on the outside, like uh, Jeff was showing you, but now we're doing the inside. Would you like the 12-inch handle? This is a pretty good size, I think, on this uh, particular bowl gouge. Uh, now, the 16th, I think, I'd, I'd, I'd be more comfortable with the handle I got, the larger one. 12 is a little small for a bowl gouge for me. A 
I'm doing this, I'm trying to think about what kind of rim I want on this pole. Because that relatively large uh, tenon I've got, I'm thinking a little bit about what kind of bowl shape I want, might want to further refine it when I do the back of the bowl. my finger going in at 90 degrees because it has a tendency to skate on you. So you get that shoulder. You can see it kicking out and skating on me. What some people advocate, you know, to avoid that skate, and it does work, it's just a technique I don't much use, is they suggest taking a parting tool and just go in here a little bit to get that shoulder started, and then you don't have to worry about it, it kicking out and ripping across your, uh, uh, the bowl rim. You got any thoughts on what we ought to do with this bowl rim, Jeff? I think we should make it slightly more fancy. Yeah. I got an idea. Uh, something okay. that I do. It's something I do a lot. I just want to. I just want to create a little design. And, uh, and to go back to what Mike was saying with the parting tool, um, in my beginner classes especially, I do teach this as an option. That way, you have you create a starting point where your bevel has support from the wood in order to begin that that tricky cut. So this, if you're if you're having problems. Uh, especially if you're just learning how to turn a bowl. If you're having problems and your tool skating back, there's no reason why you can't grab a parting tool, make a parting cut, and give yourself that starting point for the for the bevel to drop down into. It's now supported by the wood, and I have control. All right, for me, on my rims, I like them. I like them a little bit more fancy, especially if I'm not doing a bunch of texture and color on the piece. And uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, I was watching Mike turn. He's using a, a tool, it's the, same, it's the same half inch bowl gouge, but he's using a longer tool handle and he's got his hand, his lower hand at the end of the handle. That's, uh, that's his particular style and that's given him a little bit more leverage in his turn. For me, I'm almost always choked up on the swell of the handle, so a shorter handle is going to work for my style of turning. I, I'm able to get uh, a little more, I think I'm able to get a little more power with a little more control. Um, I don't know if it has to do with the difference in our stances, the fact that I have a paunch and he doesn't, that might have something to do with it, I'm not sure, but... Um, you do have a bigger turning muscle than I do. I have a much bigger turning muscle and it's, it's radius, so it's good for turning bolts. Um, long story short, there's a lot of ways to do this and my way is my way and Mike's way is Mike's way and, and as long as you're doing it safe and consistent. Consistency is the key. As long as you're doing it safely and consistently, go to it, have fun, and turn something cool. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my rim design here and see if it works for the shape of piece that we're, we're turning. And uh, maybe I'll do a little bit more work on the inside as well. Yeah, definitely need some more hollowing on the inside. Yeah. All right, so I'm just going to do a series of quick cuts to even up this rim. I want to make sure I want to make sure it's not fluttering at all. I want it to be even. And then I'm going to go down. I'm, I'm going to go down at a slight angle from the rim. I want to drop this rim maybe an eighth of an inch, and that's going to allow me to create kind of a little wedge that I can then turn away. So my rim, my rim is established, and I've got a little lip. Now I can come back, and I can just start. I can go back to that hollowing cut and I can focus on my wall thickness. Alright, so all I've done is I've cleaned up my I've cleaned up my rim and I've created a little a little chamfer which allowed me to have a little little lip here. And uh, just by doing that it gives me the uh, ability to create a small amount more 
detail. Um, simple things like this can elevate your turnings greatly without you spending a lot of time and effort or, or money on uh, exabrant, exabrant um, supplies. And uh, exabrant. That's exabrant. a new word. That's that's not, a, I that's need to add that a, to my vocabulary. I've been on the road for <laughs> many days and I'm tired. Um, expensive and exorbitant um, supplies. That's a word, right? Exorbitant. Yeah, exorbitant is definitely in my vocabulary. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go with that one. All right, so I've done that. And the reason why I'm focusing on the rim now is I still have the majority of the center mass in the core. Um, the wood rim is supported by that core mass. I haven't severed the fibers. Uh, it's holding the whole thing in together. I need to get my rim finished. I need to be happy with this because I don't want to come back to the rim once I get the inside of the bowl turned away. Uh, wood moves. It doesn't matter how wet. It doesn't matter how dry. It always moves. Sometimes it's not that much. Amen. Sometimes it's an enormous amount. Mm -hmm. And if I try to come back after removing the, the fibers that are holding the whole thing together, I can end up breaking the piece or causing myself trouble that I don't need. And the simple solution is do your rim first. So the rim's established. Let's go ahead and refine that wall thickness and then uh, hollow out the inside.